Launched in 2003, two exploration rovers are sent to Mars, Spirit and its twin, Opportunity. Their objective is to characterize the climate and geology of the planet and hunt for evidence of the history of water on its surface. The lead scientific investigator of the mission is Cornell University professor Steve Squires. They're essentially robotic geologists, and a geologist is sort of like a detective at the scene of a crime. Okay, you're looking for clues, and the clues are in the rocks, and they tell a story if you can read them. Those clues tell a story of what conditions were like in the past. As robotic geologists, both rovers are equipped with a range of sophisticated scientific equipment designed to analyze Martian soil and rock features. One of the most important is the panoramic camera, or pan cam, which records the texture and structure of the Martian terrain. Because it is the eyes of the human geologists back at JPL, pan cam has been designed to match human capabilities. They're supposed to be robot geologists. Well, how good does a, does a human geologist vision have to be? 2020. Works pretty well, right? So we gave the robots exactly that vision because we know from hundreds of years of geologists walking around on Earth that that visual acuity works. These capabilities enable both rovers to make important discoveries that conclusively point to a history of water on the surface of the Red Planet. This is Meridiani Planum, the landing site of the rover Opportunity in January 2004. It's a dusty area the size of Oklahoma. Photographs relayed back to Earth reveal the soil is littered with countless BB-sized rocks. NASA scientists nicknamed these puzzling objects blueberries. On Earth, similar deposits form, but only in standing water or hot springs. Geologists have uncovered blueberry-like clusters dating back millions of years in Lake Superior and near the hot springs of Yellowstone National Park. Their discovery on the vast plain of Meridiani Planum suggests this area was once saturated with water, or was even an ancient lake. In fact, closer examination of the surface of the planet reveals that much of it was once a water world. These images, taken by a high-resolution stereo camera aboard the Mars Express spacecraft, reveal Mars's watery, almost Earth-like past. This is a large depression called Ioni Chaos, and next to it, an outflow channel called Eris Vallis. They're the remains of Martian river systems. And to planetary geologists like Jim Rice, clear evidence of ancient catastrophic floods. We took every river on Earth and put it in one spot, had them flowing at the same time. These, some of these flood channels on Mars, when they were in full force, were 20 or 30 times bigger than those. Why in the past did we form these channels? If Phoenix can figure out if water flowed across the surface of Mars in the past, it will explain the valleys and canyons we see today. And take us one step closer to discovering if water still exists, and even life. The Phoenix mission should confirm what the experts suspect. It must have been warmer, at least for some period of time, so that we could have liquid water on the surface. And the pressure must have been higher than it is now, or the water would, would have boiled away. Early in its evolution, Mars was much warmer. In fact, it was boiling. Four point six billion years ago, our sun bursts into life and our solar system forms around it. Both Earth and Mars are huge balls of lava, boiling at over 12,000 degrees. Slowly, they begin to cool. Dr. Peter Smith heads up the Phoenix mission from its base at the University of Arizona. Earth and Mars formed at a, 
about the same time, but Mars is only half the diameter of the Earth, and therefore it would cool more rapidly. Mars's size proves to be the crucial factor in its transition from a fiery molten ball into a warm and wet planet. In this demonstration, two globes are used to represent Mars and our own planet, Earth. These scale models exactly replicate the difference in size of the two planets. Mars, shown here on the left, has half the diameter of Earth. Both spheres have been heated to the same temperature. Now they are cooling naturally. Infrared time lapse clearly shows how quickly the smaller sphere representing Mars cools. Mars was cool enough for water at a time when Earth was still a red-hot ball. This water comes from comets. The early solar system is littered with large asteroids and comets made up of ice. As they crash into the planets, the ice melts. On super-hot Earth, the water boils away instantly. But Mars is cool enough to hold on to the huge quantities of water released by impacts. And in that cooling, uh, liquid water would be stable on the surface long before it would be stable on the Earth. And so during that period, it may be that you had rains and, and valley systems and, and uh, lakes and all kinds of Earth-like situations. Scientists believe that 3.9 billion years ago, Mars had the climate and atmospheric conditions to support liquid water, an essential ingredient for life. Now, in the early days of the history of our solar system, this planet, the Earth, was not a good place for life to develop. We had noxious gases all over the places, volcanoes belching out, all sorts of stuff. Mars was warm and wet and wonderful. It was the most likely place for life to develop. Today, Mars is no longer warm, but is it wet? Understanding what happened to Mars's water is the primary goal of the Phoenix mission. Its success might hold the key to answering a 30-year-old question. Does water still exist on Mars? Scientists are now certain that Mars was once warm and wet. Pictures of ancient riverbeds, blueberries on the surface, and carbonate globules inside the Allen Hills meteorite confirm this view. But if there was water billions of years ago, where is it today? The question of whether water still exists on Mars will only be settled when NASA physically finds it. And that's the job of the Phoenix lander. It's being sent further north than any previous mission to a site chosen because frozen water might sit below the surface. In 2003, NASA's Odyssey orbiter produces this image. Using its gamma ray spectrometer, the spacecraft maps levels of hydrogen in the upper three feet of Mars's surface. Since high levels of hydrogen indicate the presence of frozen water, scientists think that these blue and violet areas, the densest concentration of the element, reveal an enormous frozen reservoir. In fact, there's so much water in the polar areas and the nearby ice terrains that if you spread that water around the surface of Mars, that alone would inundate the surface of Mars on the order of six, maybe 10 meters deep. Phoenix's first job is to confirm that the hydrogen-rich area is in fact made up of water. Then scientists can begin to piece together the chain of events that block the water under the planet's surface. Maybe then they'll begin to understand how the recent wet spots appeared. 
Some scientists believe they are a remnant of ancient climate change. Mars cools much more quickly than Earth, allowing water to exist on its surface. But a drastic shift in atmospheric conditions means it can't hold on to it. Earth's large molten core generates a magnetic field which protects our atmosphere from solar radiation. But Mars's small core cools so much that it no longer produces an effective shield. Solar wind blasts away its atmosphere and most of its water. Pressure falls and the temperature plummets. Whatever water it has boils away or freezes solid, leaving the Mars we see today, a frozen world. Up until recently, scientists believe that Mars's core is so cold that it is no longer able to crack and move the planet's surface. The Earth releases a lot of its heat continuously by a process that's known as plate tectonics, where the continental masses of the planet are actually shifted by the formation of new crust in the ocean basins. Mars doesn't have that. But the discovery of the gully features, the wet spots, suggests that Mars's core hasn't cooled as much as they thought. Because it can't release its heat as efficiently as Earth, one idea is that this heat builds up with time, and episodically there's kind of a burst of heat release that will melt the ice in the Martian permafrost. And that water comes onto the surface perhaps associated with gases that change the composition of the Martian atmosphere to a, a greenhouse kind of condition. And so you have a temporary, unstable state where Mars is warmer and has water on the surface. These small flash floods could be the wet spots that dot the surface of the planet. It's natural to suspect that maybe this uh, volcanism that has uh, happened in recent history and the water activity are somehow related. But uh, this is one of the mysteries we're trying to investigate, and uh, I think it's one of those that uh, the Phoenix Lander may be able to shed some light on. By finding ice and analyzing its composition, the Phoenix Lander is designed to map the planet's ice history it will tell us how geothermal activity and atmospheric change have affected Mars's ancient water. Load relief kick rate is ready. Vehicles responding. Vehicles recovering very nicely from the lift off transient. This is a journey into the unknown. Up to now, all of our exploration of Mars has been surficial. We take pictures from orbit, we drive around on the surface, and maybe we dig down this deep, either by dragging it with the wheels or with a little arm or something. We maybe get down this far and that's it. But Phoenix is set to change this. It's designed to endure Mars's northern latitudes and to analyze subsurface ice. NASA hopes its findings will throw light on how water interacts with the geology of Mars, the key to unlocking the story of past atmospheric change. In order to achieve this goal, it's been built to do something no other Mars lander has done before. Phoenix is going to arrive on Mars and land and dig. A sophisticated robotic arm will dig down three feet into the frozen subsurface to where the layer of water is believed to be. At nearly eight feet, the arm is the most important tool on the lander. It's designed to dig trenches, scrape ice, and deliver samples to other instruments on the lander's deck. No one knows the capability of this arm better than Phoenix's lead scientific investigator, Dr. Peter Smith. The robotic arm in 
digging on the surface is doing something very difficult because it's being controlled from a